And now on to animal and human sacrifice. Slaughtering animals, and especially humans, to gain the favor of gods is something people in civilized societies consider disgusting and evil. Yet, for some reason, despite the God of the Bible supposedly being all-powerful, he needed his followers to kill and burn animals for him in order for him to forgive them. Exodus 20:24. 20, you must build an altar for me made out of dirt. Sacrifice your burnt offerings and your fellowship offerings, your sheep, goats, and cattle on it. And Hebrews 9:22. As Moses' teachings tell us, blood was used to cleanse almost everything, because if no blood is shed, no sins can be forgiven. And several times throughout Leviticus 1 through 9, it is a burnt offering, an offering by fire, a soothing aroma to the Lord. That's right, God finds the smell of burning animals soothing. But it doesn't stop there. God demanded a human sacrifice too. Hebrews 10:10. 10, 10. Jesus Christ did what God wanted him to do by sacrificing his body once and for all. Here, God's rather disgusting desire for sacrifices culminated in his demand that his own son hang from a cross until dead. God wanted Jesus to be murdered. That was the only way that he would allow humans to be saved. Again, this despite his supposedly being all-powerful and thus, by definition, capable of forgiving people without requiring them to commit murder. Worse, in the Ten Commandments, God demands that people not commit murder. And then he turns around and requires people to commit murder in order for him to forgive them. What sense does that make? And isn't it more than a little hypocritical of God, considering all the sins he's committed? Speaking of killing people, next up is murder and genocide. Of all the evils listed here, murder and genocide are the most destructive. Yet throughout the Bible, God frequently condones or personally commits murder and genocide. The Great Flood is the example with the highest death toll. Genesis 7, 19-23 the water rose very high above the earth. Every living creature on the face of the earth was wiped out. Fundamentalists insist this was necessary because everyone had become wicked and needed to be killed. But potentially hundreds of millions of innocent babies and children drowned along with the adults. Wouldn't an all-knowing God have known what would have happened and thus been able to take steps to prevent such a thing from happening? Such as starting creation with Noah instead of Adam, for example. The fact that God let everyone become wicked and then drown them anyway implies that he wanted it to happen. Otherwise, he would have found some way to avoid committing genocide. That's bad enough, but two more examples I find particularly nasty include the aforementioned Exodus passage where God murdered all of Egypt's firstborn male children just to spite Pharaoh, and the following, Exodus 32, 27-29. He said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Each of you, put on your sword. Go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other and kill your relatives, friends, and neighbors. The Levites did what Moses told them, and that day about 3,000 people died. Moses said, Today you are ordained as the Lord's priests. God gave you a blessing today because each of you fought with your own sons and brothers. God had the Levites murder 3,000 of their relatives, friends, and neighbors, and then bless them for killing their own family members. Just imagine how you would feel if God told you to murder your own family and friends. Some Christians even today have been known to kill their own children and claim God told them to do it. But do we consider that behavior good or evil? As for stealing, this is another behavior we consider a major evil, yet at various times throughout the Bible, God orders his people to steal. Here's a good example. Deuteronomy 20, 13 through 14. When the Lord your God hands the city over to you, Kill every man in that city with your swords. But take the women and children, the cattle and everything else in the city, including all its goods, as your loot. You may enjoy your enemy's goods that the Lord your God has given you. In just this one instance, God actually tells his people to commit not just theft, but also murder, slavery, and presumably rape. Is this the behavior anyone would attribute to a good God? And finally we come to lying. Now this may seem like perhaps the least evil act on the list, considering it's something everyone does in one way or another, even if it's just the occasional white lie. But when you consider that the Bible is meant to be a guide for one's entire life, it's actually perhaps the most disturbing to learn that God lies. 1 Kings 22:23. So the Lord has put into the mouths of all these prophets of yours a spirit that makes them tell lies. The Lord has spoken evil about you. 2 Thessalonians 2:11. 2 
That's why God will send them a powerful delusion, so that they will believe a lie. Ezekiel 14, 9 If a prophet is tricked into giving a prophecy, it is I, the Lord, who tricked the prophet. In each case, regardless of the reason why, God deliberately causes people to be deceived, meaning he is quite capable of lying. And if God is capable of lying, then how can we be sure that anything he claims in the Bible is actually true? We're forced to accept the possibility that the Bible contains falsehoods, and thus nothing in it can be fully trusted. So as you can see by my examples, taken directly from the Bible itself, God is guilty of condoning or committing rape, slavery, torture, child abuse, animal and human sacrifice, murder and genocide, stealing, and lying. Now, depending on how you interpret or massage the meaning, you may quibble with a few of my examples, but even then the rest of the evidence should make it clear to any sane, civilized person that God behaves in an evil manner. And if you don't think that committing those acts means God is evil, then answer me the following question. What acts would God have to commit for you to consider him evil? Hmm? If you can't answer that, then you can't claim to be a person of sound moral judgment, can you? That's something to think about the next time you might try to convince someone to become a fundamentalist Christian.